And our guest today is uh, Dr. Michael Behe, who is Professor of Biological Sciences at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. He received his PhD in biochemistry from the University of Pennsylvania in 1978. Dr. Behe is a senior fellow with Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. And his research involves the delineation of uh, design and natural selection in protein structures. In addition to publishing over 35 articles in refereed biochemical journals, he has also written uh, editorial features in Boston Review, American Spectator, and the New York Times. His book, Darwin's Black Box, discusses the implications for neo-Darwinism of what he calls irreducible complexity, uh, the irreducible complexity of biochemical systems. The book was internationally reviewed in over 100 publications and was named by National Review and World Magazine as one of the 100 most important books of the 20th century. Behe continues to present and debate his work uh, throughout major universities uh, in North America and England. And his latest book, on which he'll speak today, is The Edge of Evolution, The Search for the Limits of Darwinism, which is just out. And if you'd please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Behe. Well, thanks very much, uh, Logan. It's a pleasure to be with you here today, and I'd like to thank the Discovery Institute uh, for hosting uh, this event. Uh, it's nice to be here in, in D.C. Uh, I did a postdoc after uh, getting my Ph.D. Uh, at Penn. I came to the National Institutes of Health, lived in Bethesda for four years, and, and uh, so it's, it's always nice to come back. I get to see some, some old friends, too. Um, <clears throat> Of course, D.C. has changed a little bit since uh, 1978. Uh, not too much, but a little bit. Uh, I talked to Logan. He said the event went from 5.30 to 7. <clears throat> so I uh, made up about um, a little over 100 slides. Uh, and then I got a separate email yesterday that says, well, you should talk for 30 to 45 minutes. And I said, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. So what I'm going to do is, is uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead, going to try to give you the highlights and uh, hopefully that'll, um, that'll uh, fit the time frame. I'll try to, to stop at least by, say, 6.30 at the latest to leave plenty of uh, time for questions. So let me get my PowerPoint fired up here <coughs> and say, okay, so the talk is the title of the book, The Edge of Evolution, and, and that's about as fancy as the PowerPoint gets. Uh, I know some people can do real, real tricks with it, but uh, that's the, the best I can do. Uh, I'm from uh, Lehigh University, as, as Logan said, but I like to say that I'm not speaking for anybody except me, and since this is uh, just so, so controversial, uh, I like to uh, make sure that everybody knows that uh, I'm not speaking for Lehigh University. But I'd like to start out with a, a little bit of a retrospective, because the new book builds on uh, my first book, Darwin's Black Box, which was published over 10 years ago. And briefly, in that book, <coughs> um, it was inspired by this passage in, in Darwin's On the Origin of Species, where he said he thought he had a good explanation for uh, features of animals. Nonetheless, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, that his theory would break down. And in this, he was emphasizing that his idea of evolution had to be gradual. Random changes had to be small changes. Uh, natural selection had to work over long periods of time. And he knew that if things changed in great leaps or or uh, rapidly, then it would look like something other than random changes uh, were involved. And in Darwin's black box, I said, well, one uh, sort of system that would be a big problem for Darwin's theory uh, is one that is irreducibly complex. And that's a fancy phrase, but it has a simple meaning. It just means that you've got some machine or system or feature of an organism that has a number of different parts and all the parts work with each other to perform some function uh, that none of the parts by itself could could perform and uh, as an as kind of a homely example from our everyday world I I use the example of a mouse trap a mouse trap has a number of different parts it's got a, a spring a wooden base something called a hammer which squashes the mouse uh, and, and various other parts and if you take any of those uh, parts away, then the 
trap doesn't work. It's not like it works half as well as it used to or a quarter as well. It doesn't work at all. You've got a broken mouse trap. Now, the relevance to Darwin's theory is that it, it seems very hard to produce something like this by the numerous successive slight modifications uh, that Darwin always insisted on. <clears throat> if you wanted to evolve something like this, you know, by something like a Darwinian process, what would you do? Would you, would you start with, say, the, the wooden platform down here and hope to catch mice inefficiently, you know, maybe trip them or something? Um, and then add another part, maybe maybe add this holding bar thing and hope that when they trip they'd impale themselves on the holding bar. And Now nah, you can't do it like that. <laughs> so irreducibly complex systems are, are big headaches for Darwin's theory. And I went on to say that there, uh, especially in, uh, in the past 50 years, science has found that the very foundation of life, the cell, um, uh, examples, many, many examples of irreducibly complex machinery and perhaps the most familiar one now, ten years down the road since, since Darwin's black box, is this example of uh, what's called the bacterial flagellum, which is literally an outboard motor that bacteria use to swim. And it's got many components that are necessary for it to function. And uh, how, if it's difficult to see how one would build a mouse trap gradually, uh, it's difficult in spades to see how you would build something like this uh, gradually. So <clears throat> that takes us now to uh, the book uh, that just came out, uh, The Edge of Evolution. Because when I was done Darwin's Black Box, <clears throat> I had argued that there were some things in life that were beyond Darwinian explanation. But I think, and, and I think it's clearly true, that there are many things for which Darwin's theory is a good explanation. There, there are simple things that it can explain pretty well. I mean, if it can't explain the flagellum, maybe it can explain variations in the shape of your nose or, or something like that. You know, relatively simple things. So if that's the case, then you can say, well, how deeply into life does design extend? Or look at the other way, how much can Darwini Darwinian or other in unintelligent mechanisms explain uh, about life? Where is the edge between chance and purpose uh, in life? And that's what the, the new book, The Edge of Evolution, uh, is concerned with. And before I, I uh, address that question, I, I want to make some distinctions because uh, as many of you know, when you talk about this subject, you can get yourself uh, confused or it, it, the conversation can be unproductive if you're not really clear what you mean by all the terms that you're using. And in particular, Darwinism, although people talk about Darwin's theory, it's really a conglomeration of little theories. There's a number of different uh, concepts uh, which are uh, put together in Darwin's theory. Some parts, since it's a con conglomeration of concepts, it's possible some of them might be right, some might be wrong, some might be up in the air. Um, so I want to point out that, first of all, <coughs> Darwin's theory contains at least three concepts. And let's tease those together right, uh, tease those apart right now. One is the idea of common descent, which is that all organisms uh, existing today have descended by a process of birth and death from organisms that lived in the misty past. And I think that's an interesting concept. There's a lot of evidence to support it. But for the, um, for the um, problems that I am interested in addressing, it's really kind of beside the point. Uh, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word trivial, but it doesn't have any explanatory power because common descent simply uh, is used to say that in the past some organism had a, a particular feature. In the present, some organism has that same feature, so maybe the present day organism inherited from the past one. Well, that, that's great. Uh, and it's interesting, but it doesn't tell you where the ancestor came from. It doesn't tell you where the feature came from. It doesn't tell you how any changes occurred from the uh, ancestor to the uh, modern species. Darwin's theory also contains the idea of natural selection. And again, uh, like common descent, it's kind of interesting, but ultimately not all that important in explaining, uh, explaining life today. Natural selection simply says that other things being equal, the more fit organisms will tend to survive and leave more offspring than the less fit organisms. 
something that's stronger, better adapted, or something like that, mm -hmm. will be around longer. Well, you know, who can argue with that? You know, that a creature that's better will do better than a creature that's worse. Uh, and the third important part of Darwin's theory is the idea of random change. And since we've discovered DNA, that's kind of boiled down to random mutation. And this is the part of Darwin's theory that does all the work. Everything that's important in Darwin's theory is wrapped up in the concept of random mutation. And as I will argue today, that is the weakest and uh, most poorly supported part of his theory and, and really counterindicated in, in most uh, uh, instances. So we're going to focus on the concept of, of random mutation. <coughs> Okay, so let's go back to the, uh, to the topic of the book. The book is called The Edge of Evolution, The Search for the Limits of Darwinism. Why think that Darwinism has any limits? You know, it explains some things. Why not say that it can, can explain everything in biology? Well, uh, there will be uh, two reasons that I'll, <coughs> I'll state today. The first thing is that life is a whole lot different than Darwin thought when he first introduced his idea in the mid-19th century. Uh, just to concentrate on cellular and molecular matters, I'm a biochemist, that's the sort of things I, I deal with. Uh, back in Darwin's day, the cell was thought to be a very simple substance. It was thought to be maybe electrified protoplasm, kind of like a little piece of jello. Nothing really, uh, nothing really that complex at all. And as a matter of fact, it was thought to be so simple that two eminent scientists of the time, Thomas Huxley and a guy named um, um, uh, Ernst Haeckel, examined some sea mud that was brought back by an English exploring ship. And they examined some of the mud in their microscopes, crude microscopes of the day, and they thought it looked like a cell. And so they named the cell Bathybius Hekelii, after Ernst Haeckel himself, and thought that cells and new life was so simple that it could bubble up from sea mud. So that was the state of science when Darwin first proposed his theory. But now we know a lot different. Now we know that the foundation of life is, is considerably more complex uh, than, than they knew. Uh, uh, for example, here's a, the uh, cover of an issue of the journal Cell from the late 1990s, a special review issue on the topic of macromolecular machines. Modern science has discovered that rather than being mud or a simple glob of jello, that the cell, again the foundation of life, the very basis of life, is enormously complex. It's like a, a, a nanoscale factory filled with uh, sophisticated machinery. Uh, <clears throat> and if you turn and you look at the table of contents of that issue of the journal Cell, you'll see papers with titles such as, The Cell is a Collection of Protein Machines, Polymerases in the Replosome, Machines Within Machines, Mechanical Devices of the Spliceosome, Motors, Clocks, Springs, and Things. So the point is that Rather than a uh, drop of mud, uh, the, uh, the uh, cell is much more like a, a very modern factory, computer controlled, uh, completely automated. Here's a computer uh, illustration of just one of those machines. I won't go into uh, how it works or anything, that, uh, but I just want to show this picture of this, which is called the eukaryotic cilium, to give you a taste of the, uh, of the structural and mechanical complexity of one of the machines. Uh, all of these little blue, uh, lighter and darker blue dots, the green and white, are uh, made of things called proteins, which are kind of the basic substance of the cell, uh, which in themselves are complex objects. And they all have to fit together uh, to form this, uh, this um, uh, really what is, is a motorized paddle uh, oftentimes used in the cell. The uh, cilium is composed of hundreds of different uh, protein parts, all of which have to find each other in the cell, uh, assemble and fit together to give this working motorized paddle. And you see the, you get a, a feeling uh, for how complex this is simply by where this illustration is published. It's published in the Journal of Nanotechnology, 
just like the technology that humans are now starting to invent to uh, to manipulate things at the atomic level, the cell has been doing it for a long, long time. So one reason we can think that Darwinism has limits is that life has turned out to be much different, much more sophisticated uh, than was initially thought. A second reason is this. It's called the problem of the rugged evolutionary fitness landscape. And uh, most people probably don't, haven't heard about these things. But uh, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a mathematician named Ronald Fisher uh, who was interested in, in biological problems as well, who said, well, let's, let's think of evolution as a hill and say that a species that's not fit so well uh, is at a lower part of the of the hill and has a particular uh, has particular DNA and maybe by a mutation it can get higher on the hill and higher and higher till it reaches the zenith and uh, that's kind of a popular view of evolution you know mutation comes along there's the organism gets better another one comes along gets even better until it's great uh, but now that we know the complexity of life this simple uh, almost cartoonish conception is really inadequate. As many people have talked about, many scientists have talked about, a more realistic evolutionary landscape would be quite rugged, where you could change one component, one nut or bolt of a molecular machine. That might help a little bit, but then to help something else, maybe you could change some other completely different component. Now, the important point about this is that in, in a situation like this, there's a direction to evolution. It can go up, it goes up until it gets it, the best it can be. But if you're an organism that's on this peak of a rugged landscape, there's no direction. You could go this way or that way or the other way. You could change a nut or a bolt or a lever or something, but you're not really accumulating uh, something uh, beneficial. Uh, and the <coughs> landscape, the, uh, such a landscape is what I call incoherent. It's substantially incoherent. That means, again, there's no particular, a change in one, uh, a change in one feature uh, is not necessarily correlated with another, a change in a, another feature that's going to help the organism. There's no net benefit in any particular machine, single machine. And scientists uh, have been recognizing this. There have been a number of books in the past 10 years written by people of good reputation, not like me, who challenge uh, Darwin's theory and say it's not adequate to explain what we knew, know about biology. One guy uh, named Richard Watson, an Englishman, uh, wrote a book called Compositional Evolution uh, last year. He's a computer scientist interested in uh, evolutionary computation. And he says, in computer science, we recognize that the algorithmic principle described by Darwin uh, as hill climbing, more specifically random hill, uh, mutation hill climbing. However, we also recognize that hill climbing is the simplest possible form of optimization and is known to work well only on a limited class of problems, kind of like on antibiotic resistance and some things I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. So, uh, uh, so things have changed for Darwin. Life is a whole lot more complex. We recognize that his idea, although it works on some things, doesn't work on much. Uh, and so there are good reasons to think that Darwin's theory is limited. Nonetheless, um, a lot of scientists, as, as you may know, uh, think that Darwin's theory is, is, an, is the explanation for all of life. For example, Richard Dawkins, who's been in the news this past year or so on, on more philosophical topics, um, wrote in 1986 that he says, we have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed to have come into existence by chance. How then did they come into existence? By gradual step-by-step -step transformations from simple beginnings. Kind of like the simple hill, the simple evolutionary landscape that I, I showed you. So he doesn't let these things, these little technicalities, uh, these little complexities of life bother him. He says that you know, no matter what, uh, we think that Darwin's theory can, can, uh, can explain everything. Uh, so it's kind of like this, the situation is. Uh, 
and this is just a cartoon I, I got off uh, the internet. You know, we've got a fellow here stranded on an island, and he's thinking to himself, well, I'll just write uh, a note in a bottle, and I'll, I'll throw it out into the ocean, and, and certainly, you know, I'll find, you know, somebody will come to rescue me, and it will probably be somebody uh, like that. Uh, and yet, if you sit down and calculate coldly what are, what's the likelihood of that happen, happening, uh, the odds are against it. Uh, so things have boiled down, especially since Darwin's Black Box was published 10 years ago, to a group of people like uh, intelligent design proponents and, and even other folks like Richard Watson saying Darwin's theory don't, doesn't work. Other people saying, yes, it does. Other people saying, no, yes, no, yes. So it's kind of stalemated, you know, yes, you know, uh, says, says so, says not, says so, says not. So what we need is evidence. And that's what the edge of evolution focuses on. It asks the question, okay, well, leave aside our imaginations, what we want. What's, what's the evidence show that Darwin, Darwinian processes do? Uh, and uh, in my book, I talk about uh, the fact that the best evidence to assess the ability of Darwinian processes comes from studies of malaria, uh, because malaria has has plagued the human race for a long time, and in this genomic era, 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 we have been able to track down genetic changes in the human genome, which has given people uh, a, a portion of a defense against malaria. Additionally, in recent years, just past five years or so, we've also been able to track down genetic changes in malaria as it developed resistance against drugs that we use to treat people. And it turns out because, <coughs> because of our detailed genetic studies of this evolutionary conflict between us and the ma a malarial uh, parasite, and because of something I'll talk about later, just the sheer number of parasites uh, that infest humanity from malaria, uh, this is the best evidence for what Darwinian processes can do. So let's start with a little overview of this. You know, I know it's, this is a little more technical and a little more uh, outside of what's normally discussed uh, uh, in evolution, so, so bear with me. I, I think the result will be uh, rewarding. So uh, when somebody uh, uh, is bitten by a malaria-infected mosquito, the malaria parasite, which is a single-celled creature, uh, gets into your body, goes to your liver, hangs out there a little while, reproduces until it makes thousands of, of uh, kind of preliminary cells which go and invade red blood cells. See, they attach themselves to a red blood cell, they go inside and they eat the hemoglobin. They eat the insides of the red blood cell. And once they have done that, they multiply to about 20 and they burst out of the red blood cell and each of the 20 goes and attaches itself to a new red blood cell where the process reproduces. So they eat your blood. And a person who dies from malaria frequently dies uh, from lack of blood. Uh, like little you know, vampires, they, they eat, uh, they drink our blood. <coughs> and uh, uh, every, uh, a lot of people here have probably seen something like this. This is a map of where malaria is in the world in blue and also where people that have a certain genetic mutation live and the mutation is for the sickle cell gene. And you notice that it, there's a large overlap between where people with sickle cell genes live and where malaria occurs, and that's because this, cha this change, uh, this genetic change confers resistance to malaria. And this has been hail, it's, this, is, this particular figure, or something like it, occurs in, in many biology texts, and it's a and it's always uh, put forward as a prime example of, of Darwinian evolution. And it is a prime example of, of Darwinian evolution. <laughs> um, so, uh, but to understand why it shows tiny changes, you know, kind of like scratches on a car, tiny changes in a pre-existing system, and why it in fact shows the limits of Darwinism much more than its possibilities, I'm going to, I'm afraid, give you a little bit of details about what's going on exactly at the molecular level um, 
in this, uh, in this example of Darwinian evolution. And I emphasize in the book that you, you, know, uh, you really have to, if you're going to really rigorously evaluate Darwin's theory, you have to look at where it's acting. And much of the action, although we can't see it, much of the action takes place in the DNA and proteins at the molecular level of life. So inside your red blood cells is hemoglobin. That's a molecule, a protein that transports oxygen from your lungs to your fingers and toes and, and everything else. And this is just kind of a schematic drawing of hemoglobin showing uh, these sausage-like things, which are uh, things called, uh, which are chains of, of amino acids uh, together. And that's one representation. Here's a second, oh, I'm sorry. Um, just, to, just for scale, you remember that uh, magnificent complex cilium that I showed you before uh, in the Journal of Nanotechnology, this whole hemoglobin molecule would be one of the blue dots in that structure. So although this looks complex here, uh, it is dwarfed by the complexity of other things. And, and this is essentially just one, you know, a nut or a bolt uh, in, a, in a larger system. Now we can draw the hemoglobin molecule in another form, and I don't mean to tax you again, but, uh, but I think this is the best way to get the idea across. This is just kind of a, a writing down the one letter abbreviations of the amino acids in the, in the uh, chains of hemoglobin. There are 140 in two different chains of hemoglobin. In, sickle cell, in the sickle cell gene, the mutation that gives resistance to malaria that allows thousands and thousands of people to live who otherwise would die from malaria, one thing has changed. The amino acid at position number six right here has been changed from an E to a V. And that's it, okay? Just that tiny, tiny change. Remember, this is just one tiny part uh, and the cilium contains hundreds of, of, of uh, molecules like hemoglobin, this is only one part of a tiny part of a protein. Okay, so this one change allows the hemoglobin uh, to confer resistance to malaria. How does that do that? It turns out that the, when the V, the E is changed to a V, it's like putting a wad of chewing gum on part of the hemoglobin. Makes it sticky. That allows it to stick to another molecule of hemoglobin in the red blood cell. Turns out there are hundreds of millions of copies of the hemoglobin in the red blood cell, so they all stick to each other and they form a solid. They essentially precipitate. It's kind of like boiling jello and when you cool it down it congeals. Well here the hemoglobin is congealing within the red blood cell. And here's an electron micrograph, a, a powerful microscopic picture. You see these sickle cell fibers, they're forming inside a red blood cell where normally it's a nice liquid, s liquid solution, now it's like a bag of cement, it's congealed. Here's a microscope picture of normal cells, here are sickled cells. You see the cell has been severely distorted by, by this process. Now this is good when a person has one copy of the sickle gene and a malarial parasite goes in a normal red blood cell and it causes it to, to change shape to the sickle form because then the spleen of the person recognizes this as distorted, grabs the cell, destroys it along with the malarial parasite inside. Unfortunately, <clears throat> some people inherit two copies of the sickle cell gene, one from their mom, one from their dad, and it turns out that when you have two copies of the sickle cell gene, you don't need a malarial parasite entering your red blood cell to push it into the sickle form. It will go into the sickle form every time the red blood cell dumps off its oxygen at, in the periphery uh, and enters your veins. And that can cause the cells to get stuck in the capillary, jam things up and, and uh, cause severe problems and sickle cell disease uh, kills many, many people worldwide each year. So the point is that <clears throat> this paradigmatic example of Darwinian evolution is a tiny change in a, in a pre-existing part of a system 
uh, which causes severe collateral damage. Well, okay, that's, that's one example. But there are many different types of DNA mutations. The, the one that changed in sickle cell disease was called a substitution, where you switch that E for a V, one kind of uh, nucleotide for another. It's actually an amino acid in the, uh, in the protein. But you can have mutations that are deletions, where you omit some nucleotides or, or other things, insertions, inversions, and, and many other types. And it turns out that some of them have cropped up in the human genome in places that also confer some resistance to malaria. And here's a table showing uh, the, by far the most prominent ones. Here's the sickle cell mutation. That leads to sickle cell disease. Another mutation that confers some resistance to malaria is called alpha thalassemia, in which one gene for one of the chains of hemoglobin is deleted, thrown out. And it turns, and that leads to anemia, and it, of course it breaks the gene. But nonetheless, for complicated reasons I'm not going to go into, that allows a cell to be a little bit resistant to malaria. You can do the same thing with the other, the beta chain of hemoglobin. Throw it out, and that helps a little bit against malaria. You can break some other genes, something called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, G6PD, if that is deleted, it turns out that helps in the fight against malaria. We're not building anything here, though. We're breaking things. We're throwing things out. Another one, band 3 protein, Duffy antigen. Again, throwing them out or turning them off uh, helps in the fight against malaria. So here's the picture I want to leave with you of Darwinian evolution at work. And this is another picture I grabbed off the web. This is a picture of soldiers, I think it's in Colombia in South America. And it turns out the army had gotten wind of where uh, a camp was, which was being used by uh, folks involved in the drug trade. And they were on their way to raid the camp. And the folks in the drug trade got wind of it, and they blew up the bridge. Now that's a beneficial change if you are the folks involved in the drug trade. It stops them from invading your camp. Turns out, like many of the mutations involved in malaria resistance, are exactly like that at the molecular level. The malarial parasite has to grab onto machinery of the red blood cell to work its way in. One way to stop the malarial parasite is to blow up that molecular bridge, throw it out, and that's what human cells do. But again, we are not making machinery. We're destroying it. Blowing up a bridge might be useful in some circumstances, but it does not tell you how you build a bridge. <clears throat> and this is just uh, to make the point, this is a quote from a paper on, uh, on malaria and human genetic changes in regard to it, that what I've been telling you about are the best examples of natural selection that we know about in humans. This is what we best know that Darwinian evolution does. So again, much Darwinian evolution proceeds by breaking old genes. Uh, another important point that I'll hit on here is that very few of possible accessible mutations help. There was a handful of mutations on that slide, but there are trillions of changes one could make to the human genome by deleting or substituting or inserting uh, different amino acids or nucleotides. So very few changes help, and the ones that do uh, degrade the human genome. Okay, well that's one example, um, but uh, do we have any other examples? And, and the answer is yes, and uh, one of the best is, is outside the, the example of malaria. I'll get back to that. Uh, but it's based on work done by a, a man named Richard Lems Lemsky at Michigan State, who's done some excellent work on uh, bacteria in the past decade and a half. And he's just been elected to the National Academy of Sciences for this work. Uh, the problem with humans is that they breed too slowly, you know, 10 years, 20 years, uh, generation time. But bacteria, like E. coli, Escherichia coli, which lives in, in guts, can be cultured in the laboratory. And you can grow it with a generation time of half a dozen generations a day. And you can grow it in enormous numbers. And Richard Lenski has done exactly that. And he grew E. coli uh, with a, a total population perhaps 100 times 
the number of humans that have ever lived that have had malaria. Uh, and he's gone through about a hundred times the number of generations, 30,000 generations, uh, then uh, have experienced uh, malaria in, in recent years uh, in humans. So he has, he has uh, gone from uh, orders of magnitude more generations with a whole lot more organisms uh, simply to see what evolution would do uh, with these bacteria. And it turns out it does pretty much the same thing as we saw in the case of malaria in humans. Uh, in recent years, he's published his findings that <coughs> genes for something called uh, something that makes a, a substance called ribose were deleted, destroyed, thrown out by the E. coli genome. Uh, that uh, that um, mutations in something where is it? And uh, another opera or another gene for, that makes a sugar called maltose. They were also thrown out or destroyed. Uh, he's uh, recently published work uh, showing a number of other genes, and you see all these little arrows. That's where mutations occur repeatedly uh, in the same gene in different kind of flasks, laboratory flasks that he's growing, showing that breaking these g different genes has been beneficial to the organism. So uh, without going into much detail, the general results he gets with many more organisms and much longer generations uh, is what we see in, in sickle cell. So we are not here building models. We're not hypothesizing what uh, Darwinian evolution should do. This is an observation of what it does do. And what we see, uh, what, a people have, oh, what people have seen before, is that of those mutations that affect an or organism, about 99% are detrimental. And Darwinists have always said, yeah, yeah, but the 1% that are beneficial, they're the ones that are they're most important. The, the ones that are detrimental, you never hear from again. But what we see from sickle cell and the E. coli work is that even the beneficial mutations, the great majority, all of the ones that we see, break genes or degrade function. And here's another little cartoon that I would like to, to leave to impress in your head. This is what random mutation does. It's a bull in a china shop. The genome, many of the proteins, the molecular machinery and cells is very finely tuned and random mutation is, uh, is unlike, unlikely to help, help it. And again, this is not an argument, it's an observation. So let's get back to malaria. And here's the uh, mosquito, Anopheles uh, gambiae, which transmits uh, the worst form of malaria in Africa. And uh, here's an electron micrograph of malarial parasites, the single-celled malarial parasites, eating red blood cells and bursting out from them. The nice thing about malaria, at least from one point of view, uh, is that, you know, we, I said that the E. coli work had orders of magnitude, hundreds of times more organisms than, um, than uh, uh, were involved in, in the human studies. Well, m the malarial parasite has even greater numbers, you know, many, many more uh, numbers of parasites uh, exist in the world than have existed in, say, Richard Lenski's experiments. Um, <coughs> I don't know if you all remember your exponential notation, uh, your scientific notation, uh, but here's a, a little, uh, a little uh, um, table to show that you can represent big numbers just by putting a 10 and a superscript beside it uh, that uh, shows that numbers increase very rapidly. For example, 10 to the 6th is a million, 10 to the 12th is a trillion, and so on. Well, how many malarial parasites are there in the world? <coughs> Well, it turns out that a person who's sick with malaria, when the malaria reproduces and grows inside him, uh, can have on the order of 10 to the 12th a trillion, a trillion cells, a trillion malarial cells in one person. And every year, hundreds of millions of people get sick with malaria. So if you work out the math, it turns out that there are on the order of 10 to the 20th malarial cells produced each year uh, in the world. Now, uh, to put this in perspective, 10 to the 10 to the 20th. If Richard Lenski 
continued his experiments, he would have to continue his experiments for another billion years to get the same number of, mal of cells that occur each year in, in malaria. So the point is that with a huge number of cells, random mutation has that many more opportunities to come up with some lucky change, some fortunate change in an organism for which natural selection can grab onto and run with it. And <clears throat> it turns out that uh, the malarial parasite has wanted to deal with uh, some drugs that, that humans have invented uh, in the past uh, 50 years or so uh, and find ways around them. Uh, the drug, the most effective drug against malaria for a long time, for decades, was something called chloroquine. Here's the molecular structure of it and it kills the malarial parasite. Uh, but unfortunately, after a decade or two of using chloroquine, the malarial parasite has become resistant to it. And again, Darwinists have pointed to this as a good example of what Darwinian evolution can do. And again, they're right. But again, just like sickle cell, it points much more strongly to the limits of random mutation than to the uh, and then to its, its uh, capacities. Only uh, four, about four or five years ago, the mutations that conferred resistance to chloroquine in malaria were tracked down after a lot of hard work by a number of laboratories. Uh, and uh, oh, here's, the, um, here's a story from the, uh, the journal Science from uh, a few years ago. Uh, emphasizing that chloroquine is, is now really no longer effective because of this uh, acquisition of resistance by malaria. And it turns out that, it, uh, that just like sickle cell disease involved specific changes in particular amino acids in a particular protein, hemoglobin, resistance to chloroquine does too. A, a, uh, a protein called PFCRT, which stands for Plasmodium falciparum, falciparum chloroquine resistance trait, it's just a protein that is changed, had a couple amino acids changed. Any, and different, different proteins from different parts of the world turned out had anywhere from four to eight changes. But two changes occurred in almost all of the resistance strain, here and here. Um, and it turns out that having to change two or more than one vastly increases the difficulty of random mutation finding that combination for the same reason that I don't know if anybody here plays Powerball I'm sure you're all upstanding citizens don't do that uh, I do it all the time uh, and uh, as you know if you have to match one number it's easy if you have to match two it goes up exponentially if you have to match three it goes up ex exponentially with the number that you have to match the same way with changes in DNA if you have to match more than one Matching one is really not a problem for Darwinian processes. Matching two, it starts really breathing hard. It, it, it has a tough time. For example, here's the frequency of development of resistance to two different antibiotics by the malarial parasite, P. falciparum. There is one antibiotic called atovaquone. And it turns out that in a clinical study, if you give it to three patients, one of those patients will have spontaneous resistance due to a malarial parasite that had a mutation in it because you only have to change one amino acid. So resistance pops out up in about every 10 to the 12th cells. But if you have to change two, you have to get them both right, resistance to chloroquine arises about in every billionth patient, about every one in 10 to the 20th cells. Now it turns out that malaria has 10 to the 20th cells occur every year, so it can uh, overcome this without too much trouble. It, it's breathing hard anyway, but for larger species like you know humans or elephants or fish or where the populations are much lower than 10 to the 20th, it would take many, many, many years uh, to develop a, um, a, a mutation of, of this complexity. Now this number 10 to the 20th is, is actually kind of interesting um, if you know how to do exponents. Um, it turns out that there have been in the history of life on Earth, the past four billion years or so, 
there have been about 10 to the 40th cells, 10 to the 40th. You'll know that, notice that 10 to the 40th, the exponent is about twice that. So there's good reason to think if you needed in the history of life a mutation that was just twice as complex as the mutation that uh, malaria needed to overcome chloroquine, that would be beyond the capacity of life on Earth to generate by random mutation. And again, I'd like to emphasize that what I'm doing here is I'm not arguing that Darwinism cannot make complex functional systems. The data on malaria and the other examples are an observation that it does not. And in science, observation beats theory all the time. So uh, Professor Dawkins can, can speculate about what he thinks Darwinian processes could do, but in nature, Darwinian processes have not been shown to do anything uh, in particular. Well, I'm going to skip uh, a slide or two because I'm, uh, I'm a professor, so I, I could talk for a long time. And I'm going to say that is, that is where the data stops. Now I'm going to make an argument, and this is the argument. When two proteins have to bind together, like several chains of hemoglobin or the many different proteins in cilia, why do they bind together? The reason they bind together is because their physical surfaces are complementary to each other. These are supposed to be two proteins that have complementary surfaces. And the chemical nature of the contacting groups has to be complementary as well. And it turns out that typically you need a number of different, five or six different uh, contacts on the protein surface in order to get two proteins to bind together. And each of the proteins, each of the different, some of the proteins are repeated many times, but each of the different kinds of proteins in a machine like the cilium, they all have to have complementary surfaces that cause them to stick together. <coughs> I'll skip this one here. Uh, additionally, they don't just have to stick together, they have to assemble themselves. In our everyday world, machines are assembled by people or, or by machines that have been programmed to do so. In the cell, machines have to assemble themselves. And this is a, a little essay from the journal Nature of uh, two years ago saying that the ability of cilia and other machinery to spontaneously assemble themselves in the uh, cell it's as though cars could be manufactured by merely tumbling their parts onto the factory floor. This is not a negligible part of biology. The ability of proteins to stick to each other specifically and with enough force is crucial uh, to their properties. Uh, and here's just my little foray into philosophy. Uh, 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 Thomas Aquinas was quoted by uh, Cardinal Christoph Schoenborn a few months ago in the journal First Things, and Thomas Aquinas compares uh, biology to shipbuilding <coughs> and says, well, it's the same thing. Nature is, is, uh, just technical, is just technology, but that itself assembles. And so we can tell, essentially, that there's purpose behind this because the, uh, the uh, parts of life assemble themselves. Well, Thomas Aquinas didn't know anything about the cilium, uh, but the more and more deeply we go into biology, the more um, compelling uh, this self-assembly uh, needs to become. <coughs> so uh, the argument I make in my book, which I'll just state here, is that the ability to get two protein-protein binding sites is beyond what we would expect from random processes. And yet, in a typical cell, there are on the order of 10,000 protein binding sites. And if you look at the data, uh, and this is data from those studies I talked about, there was only one protein-protein binding site uh, developed by random mutation, that's the sickle cell site. Even in 10 to the 20th malaria, we did not get uh, such a thing. So I argue that <coughs> the limits of Darwinism, the search for the limits of Darwinism is, is uh, the limits of Darwinism are very strict. That is, that Darwinism explains much, much less of life than I would have thought a decade ago. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, 
uh, I argue that design extends much, much deeper into life uh, than uh, I would have thought then, too. Okay, let's, let's just skip over that. Let's skip over this, too. Um, okay, well, proteins, who cares about that? Uh, just biochemists. Uh, but most people, when they think about evolution, think about giraffes and elephants and dinosaurs and so on. Large animals. Um, <clears throat> and here's a relatively large animal. This is the fruit fly Drosophila. And a lot of work has been uh, uh, done in the past decade or decade and a half onto how complex animal bodies like this arise from the interaction of proteins and, and genes. And just skipping over it briefly, the answer is it isn't easy. Uh, just with everything else, the more and more we know about it, the more and more complex uh, it turns out to be. All these names here are different protein parts. And this, uh, almost like electrical or computer diagram, is the interactions that are necessary to build one particular <coughs> tissue in one small animal. Um, so because of the need for multiple steps, to set this up and the coherence of the system, um, I say that there are good empirical reasons uh, to think that design extends at least to the level of vertebrate class, that is fish, birds, and, and so on. Uh, I would bet that it extends much deeper, but that's as far as our, as our uh, evidence uh, takes us so far. Okay, um, so that's what I say. Uh, but I, I was really surprised and flattered to find that almost concurrently with my book, a number of reviews of it uh, have been published, uh, uh, some by uh, 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 major scientific journals. For example, the journal Science uh, published a review just la last uh, week, a, a two-page review by a very uh, prominent scientist by the name of Sean Carroll, who's a, 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 an evolutionary biologist. And uh, we shall say he, di he did not like the conclusions uh, of the book. Um, well, let me just review very briefly uh, a couple of his chief reasons for, for uh, not liking the book. First of all, he says, my chief er error is that I minimize the power of natural selection to act cumulatively. That is to say that one change is good, next change will make it better, and next better yet. <clears throat> Furthermore, that there are examples of this cumulative selection, including something called pyrimethamine resistance, which is a drug used in, uh, against malaria. And I omit this, and uh, a notable omission, so kind of insinuating that I'm avoiding data that, that doesn't fit with the thesis. Well, I'm confused about this because on page 75 of my book, I talk specifically about pyrimethamine. And I say that, I say specifically that uh, the first mutation grants some resistance, adding more mutations uh, and can increase the level of resistance. I talk about exactly what he says I'm not talking about. So I, I'm, I'm just uh, confused. Uh, he, he must have something else in mind that, that he didn't put down on paper. Uh, additionally, I talk about other examples of cumulative mutation. I talk about a hemoglobin called hemoglobin C. Harlem and say that developed exactly the way uh, Darwin envisioned by numerous successive slight modifications. And I also say in the book that random mutation is the perfect tool for the evolutionary job when steps are continuous and close together. That is when you can accumulate mutations. But then I go on to say that, well, if they're not, then it's a problem. And I go on to argue that that is, in fact, the case. So uh, I, I um, I'm don't know what Professor Carroll's thinking of. I, I do speak about exactly what he, uh, he wanted uh, spoken about. And then he goes on to say that my further argument about protein-protein binding sites, uh, he does not think uh, holds water. As a matter of fact, he says that what I argue is beyond the limits of Darwinian evolution actually is within its demonstrated powers. It's demonstrated. We already know that it can do those things. Uh, and he reiterates, it has been demonstrated that new protein interactions and protein networks can evolve fairly rapidly and are thus within the limits of evolution. But if you actually go and read those papers, it turns out they are not demonstrations. They are comparisons of protein sequences between different phyla. They have different sequences. They have different interactions. And the authors ascribe them to Darwinian evolution. And that's the problem 
uh, not only with the authors there, but with Professor Carroll and, and many Darwinists. They read into the data their theory. They say, this happens in this organism, this happens in that organism, therefore it must have happened by Darwinian processes. But when we were asking about demonstrations, this is a demonstration. This shows that in an enormous number of opportunities, no such protein-protein binding sites did occur, and that the production of them is a whole lot more difficult than I think Professor Carroll um, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is um, recognizing. Okay, uh, let me say that this is the end of the biology. In the final chapter, I go off the deep end. Um, if I haven't already, uh, and I talk about kind of philosoph more philosophical matters, and I especially talk about how these, the results in biology fit like a hand in a glove, results from other scientific disciplines such as physics and cosmology, which point to the fine tuning or give evidence of design of the universe for life. And this is supposed to be a picture of the Big Bang, uh, which we now know has to be very finely tuned to allow for a universe to produce life, and it's been called uh, the Goldilocks universe. Can't be too hot, can't be too cold, has to be just right. And this is a very lively topic. Just last year in the journal Nature, our universe outrageous fortune uh, was an article talking just exactly about that, about how the universe is balanced on a knife edge uh, to allow life to occur. Furthermore, if you read in the philosophy literature, which I try not to do, um, you see, I hope there are no philosophers here, uh, that in fact the fine tuning of the universe, uh, two possible explanations are usually envisioned, the design hypothesis and essentially the multi-universe, infinite universe hypothesis. And I, I uh, talk about that in my book, but let's look at the design hypothesis for a second. The fine tuning, what we have discovered uh, as science has learned more and more about the universe, and just like the cell in the 19th century, the universe was thought to be pretty bland too, pretty simple. But now we know there are finely tuned laws and constants. But more than that, we know that there are finely tuned properties of chemicals. If water wasn't just what it is, we'd be in big trouble. If carbon wasn't what it was, we would be in trouble. Furthermore, there are what I call finely tuned details and events. And let me kind of skip, these are books that talk about exactly those things, uh, recent books. Uh, let's just look at the finely tuned origin of the moon. These days astronomers think that the moon arose by something looks like a serendipitous process. Some Mars-like, Mars-sized body hit the nascent Earth. This is supposed to be the developing Earth. Notice that the, the arrow isn't pointing right to the middle. It had to hit at a certain angle. If it didn't, it wouldn't work. And that was just the right angle to produce our moon. Turns out without our moon, life on Earth would be history um, for various reasons. And as uh, astronomers, or as uh, Peter Ward and uh, Dan Brownlee discuss in their book, Rare Earth, which argues that our Earth is probably pretty close to the only one in the universe that could support life, uh, the getting of that moon to, uh, from this collision is a very finely tuned event. My point uh, in the last chapter is that <clears throat> many people think that the laws of the universe were finely tuned to permit life, but kind of want to leave it at that. But if you leave it at that, there's a good chance that that asteroid, or whatever it was, might miss. What happens if you have a great gravitational constant. You have a great charge on an electron, just right, but the, 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 uh, the asteroid misses the Earth, and now you have essentially a barren planet where the Earth should have been. Uh, so in order to produce life on Earth, you not only need the right laws of physics, the right properties of chemicals, you need the right events to occur too. And I make the same argument for the origin of life. The origin of life is continues to be unexplained and a real, a real uh, stumper. Um, it's, it's hard even to find a good hypothesis uh, for the origin of life. And the astronomer, or physicist Paul Davies, uh, wrote in a book about seven years ago 
that the problems are so great that it demands some radically new ideas. And my idea, radical and new, or something, uh, is that we can envision the origin of life as just another finely tuned event, kind of like the, the production of the moon from that collision. And we can envision the changes that occur in biology as more and more and more and more finely tuned events. I know this will strike a lot of people as strange. It, people, it, this is not often an idea you hear, and I develop it in more length in the chapter, but don't have time to go into it here. So here's the picture that I'm uh, kind of trying to paint here in the final chapter. We go from very general laws of nature to more specific, like properties of carbon, to even more specific, like uh, the origin of the earth and moon, to into biology, into cells, into molecular machinery, into more specific uh, types of biology, classes, orders, family, genera, and so on. I'm saying that the more that we have known, we knew that the laws, we, when we discovered the laws of nature, we saw that they were fine-tuned, but the more we knew, we saw that the Big Bang had to have the right speed and right amount of matter. And the more we knew, we saw that certain chemicals had to have the proper they, they did, and that our planet had to be in the right place in the solar system, and our solar system the right place in the, gang, in the galaxy, and that the, the, the uh, uh, origin of life is, is, uh, had to be accounted for, and the uh, properties of certain biochemicals. And with Darwin's black, <coughs> black box, I s essentially say design goes to this depth on the scale. And with the edge of evolution, I say it's much closer, much further down here, that random processes can probably explain changes up to the species level in biology. And somewhere in the middle there lies the broad edge of random uh, evolution. And uh, uh, just briefly, that profound questions remain unanswered, like the problem of evil. Um, because if you're going to say design extends all this far, you have to admit that some things that don't like us and we don't like them, like malaria, you know, required design as well. Uh, so, you know, I'll leave that to theologians and philosophers to deal with. <clears throat> but nonetheless, this problem is not new. And the English poet William Blake, uh, in his well-known poem, The Tiger, or at least the first couple lines are well-known, um, contemplated this too. He's thinking about this magnificent animal with these very sharp teeth and claws. And he says, did he who made the lamb make thee? Did he who made the lamb make malaria or other things that are, are, uh, can cause us harm? And my own feeling, uh, for what it's worth, uh, and again, I have a PhD, but I'm no philosopher, uh, is that if you're going to make life, if you're going to set up a stage where intelligent creatures can live their lives and do interesting things and be moral agents, you have to design a stage which will allow that to occur. You've got to build things. You've got to build the, uh, build the platform and so on. And, and that the platform turns out to be surprisingly intricate and uh, turned out to require a lot more effort uh, than we knew. <coughs> but nonetheless, that, that all the world's a stage, that good things, love can happen, and bad things can happen uh, too. Uh, so with that overly long uh, discussion, uh, I, thanks very much for your attention.